Hey, welcome back to LSAT Games. Prep test 34, game four. I'm going out of order here, going out of pocket. I want to look at another in and out game. We've done a few in and out games before. I may put them in the description below, or maybe not. If you just look in the playlist, it'll say in and out game. I want to look at an in and out game, but specifically, I want to talk about what make splittable versus not splittable conditional clues. So an in and out game you're probably familiar with is a special kind of grouping game with exactly two groups. And usually it's structured so that the elements have to go in one of those two groups. In many cases, it's also literally structured as either you're in this certain group or you're out. You're in the forest or you're out of the forest. You're on the plane or you're not on the plane. In this particular case, it's actually not structured that way. Each of exactly six doctors, J, K, L, N, O, and P, is at exactly one of two clinics, S or R. And so we're actually gonna have to make a decision in a few minutes about how we symbolize clues and how we build the diagram, since it's not specifically like you're either selected to be at a clinic or you're not. Instead, you're either at this clinic or that one. But we're gonna worry about that in a second. What I'm more interested in are the conditional clues. The clues on an in and out game are usually all or almost all conditional statements, if then statements. And we wanna be able to symbolize if then statements nicely, and we want them to stay pretty simple. We don't want a lot of complexity in these statements. And so when I read something like the third clue here, if Longtree is at Souderton, then both Nance and Palermo are at Ransboro. I have a problem because how am I supposed to symbolize a both and and try to keep that relatively simple? And it happens again later on. You can see the last clue here. If P is at R, then both K and O are at S. And so sometimes what we want to be able to do is take conditional statements and split them up. So let's start with a simple example, like if H is in, G and P are also in. Let's think about what we would be able to do in a very typical in and out style diagram right now. If some specific question told us H is in, this clue would activate. And we wanna think about what does this clue mean? What do I need to do next? When we're deciding whether a clue is splittable or not, basically what we're deciding is, is there something that G and P have to do with each other? So we have to think about them together at the same time, in which case our clue would not be splittable, or is the fact that they're both mentioned in the clue basically more of a coincidence, and we can really think of them separately from each other, and therefore our clue is in fact what we call splittable. In this particular case, G and P actually have nothing to do with each other. The clue says if H is in, G and P are in. But think about it from this perspective. If I see H in, should I expect to see G in no matter what? No matter what's going on with P. P has essentially nothing to do with it. If H is in, I'm going to see G. The answer is obviously yes. Because of course, if both G and P are in, then for sure we can say that G is in. In precisely the same way, if H is in, what's my expectation about P? Regardless of what's going on with G, if H is in, I'm expecting P to be in. And so what that tells me is that when the and is on what we call the consequent side, the then side of the conditional statement, that is a splittable statement. We would typically symbolize this something like if H is in, G and P is in. And so what I always tell my students is when you can see and following the arrow, that is a splittable conditional statement. And we would actually want to symbolize this as two separate conditionals. If H is in, G is in, and if H is in, P is in. So when the and follows the arrow, that is a splittable statement. Let's talk about some other splittable scenarios. So let's actually use that same clue. If H is in, G and P are in. Again, typically the way we would symbolize that is something like if H is in, G and P are in. Now we've already said that's actually a splittable clue, but let's say for a second we didn't split it up, and now we need to come up with our contrapositive. A contrapositive, of course, when we're talking about conditional statements, means flip and negate the conditional statement. The example I always use with my students is you start with something like, if you were born in Dallas, then you were born in Texas. Well, the contrapositive of that statement would be to flip those conditions around and negate them. That's the same thing as saying, if you weren't born in Texas, then you weren't born in Dallas. Or at least, if the initial statement is true, then that contrapositive also has to be true. In this case, flipping and negating would look something like this. If G is out or P is out, that is the opposite or the negation of and is or, then H is out. And again, let's think about what this would mean in terms of our expectation of seeing something in the game. If we were told, hey, G is indeed on the outside, do we need to know something about P before we can conclude that H is on the outside? If we do, 
then this is not a splittable statement. We need to keep it together. But if actually we don't need to know anything about P in order to say for sure, yes, H is also on the outside, then it is a splittable conditional statement. And you can probably tell here that's exactly what's going on. If G is on the outside, this is an or statement. Only one part of that part of the conditional statement needs to be true to activate the conditional statement. So yeah, seeing G on the outside is all I need to know to tell me, yes, H is on the inside. So this is also a splittable statement. Meaning in general, if I see or preceding the arrow, if I see or on the if side of the conditional statement, or sometimes what we call consequent, what's the other one? Apotesis? No. What is it called when it follows the if? Antecedent. If I see the or on the antecedent side of the conditional statement, that is a splittable statement. What that means here is that I can actually symbolize this conditional statement with two separate contrapositives. If G is out, for sure we know that H is out. And if P is out, for sure we know that H is out. But again, G and P actually have nothing to do with each other here. Now, you can probably tell this does not cover all scenarios. For example, we know what happens when and is on the consequent side, when it follows the arrow, but what happens when and precedes the arrow? If I have a clue that says something like, if H and G are in, then P is in. Now I want to think again, okay, what do I need to see in order to activate this clue? Can I separate out H and G? They don't actually matter to each other. Or does the clue only activate when something is happening with them together? That is, there is some kind of dependent relationship. So let's think about it. If we just saw H on the inside, would that be enough to tell us P is also in? No. If we saw just G on the inside, would that be enough to tell us that P is in? No. This clue only activates when H and G are on the inside. And so in this case, this is not a splittable clue. When I have the and preceding the arrow, when and comes on the if side or the antecedent side, that is not a splittable statement. You can probably imagine, correspondingly, when the or follows the arrow, when we get that from, say, the contrapositive of a statement with and on the if side of the statement, that is not going to be a splittable statement. Again, if you want an actual example, imagine the contrapositive here, which would say something like this. If P is out, then either the opposite of and would be or. Either H or G is also out. But we wouldn't know which one, right? If we put P on the outside, we can't say for sure which of H or G is the one that goes out there. We know it would be one of them, at least one of them, but from just this information, it's not enough to say which one. So we cannot split this up into two different conditional statements. We have to keep it together. There is one other word that kind of comes up in these compound conditional statements with some frequency, and that is nor. It's tempting to think that nor is gonna follow the same rules as or, but nor is actually the same as and. It's inclusive language that means something is happening together in some sense. And so nor actually follows all the same rules as and. If you see it in the consequent part of the statement, that is it follows the then or follows the arrow, that's a splittable statement. If you see it on the antecedent side of the statement, on the if side of the statement, it's preceding the arrow in your symbols, that is not splittable. All of which to say, let's try and use this on this fourth game, an in and out game from prep test 34. I've already read the setup, and again, the big thing we need to decide here is how to set up our diagram. Because it's not a classical in and out game, I'm gonna do something like this. I'm gonna symbolize my inside with S, just so I remember it refers to that particular clinic, Souderton or whatever. And the outside I'm gonna refer to as R. But all my symbols are still going to be positive for the left side of the diagram, negative for the right side of the diagram. Meaning when I read something like this first clue here, K is at R if J is at S, I'm actually gonna read that this way. First of all, of course, I wanna begin with the if part of the statement, if J is in, then R is out. So that is, I'm not paying attention to the S or the R part as much as the in or the out part. If J is in, K is out. Contrapositives, of course, we don't really think of them like typical deductions. We always come up with the contrapositives immediately. So let's flip and negate. If K is in, then J is out. Second clue, again, starting with the if. If J is out, R is the outside of our game. O is in. If J is out, O is in. And contrapositive, of course, flip and negate. If O is out, then J is in. And here we get the statement that we're gonna have to figure out, is it splittable or not? If L is in, then both N and P are out. Well, and in this case, 
follows then. It would follow the arrow in our symbol. And so this is actually a splittable statement. N and P have nothing to do with each other. So if L is in, N is out. And of course, the contrapositive there would be that if N is in, L must be out. But then also, if L is in, P is out. So if L is in, P is out. And it's contrapositive, if P is in, then L must be out. If N is out, again for us, R is on the outside, then so is O. So if N is out, O is out. And the contrapositive there, if O is in, N is in. And I think we just have one more. If P is out, then both K and O are in. Once again, and is following, then and is on the consequent side. So this is a splittable statement. If P is out, K is in. And the contrapositive there, if K is out, P is in. And then the splittable portion, if P is out, O is in. And the contrapositive again, if O is out, P must be in. Now, as I've talked about on other in and out game videos, I do not recommend beginning now to chain all these different statements together. I think that's a really bad use of your time because any chain that happens is gonna happen naturally on any specific question that tells us something to do. Just to give you an example of what I mean, take something like number 20. 20 says this, if P is out, that's the R side of our diagram, which one of the following must be true? Well, for example, going to my clues, I know that this last clue activates right away. If P is out, K is supposed to be in. P is out, O is supposed to be in. And now I would also be able to say things like, oh wait, if O is in, N is in. And so I'm gonna put N on the inside. It's certainly true that we could have chained together if P is out, O is in, if O is in, N is in, and come up with a deduction like if P is out, N is in. And then it's contrapositive, if N is out, P is in. But we're doing it anyway as we answer question number 20. We don't need to refer to a specific deduction to figure that out, we just need to refer to our original symbols. And again, in this case, the chain actually keeps going. This is why we sometimes call those domino deductions. When N is in, we know that L is supposed to be out, but we don't need a specific deduction that tells us if P is out, L is also so out, it's just happening naturally as we place the elements. The only other element we haven't placed at this point is J. We can find a couple clues that deal with J, including one that's actually gonna apply here. When K is in, J is supposed to be out. So I'm gonna put J on the outside. But notice, I've been able to place all six elements now without having come up with a bunch of these domino deductions. So I just don't think they're worth your time. Let's go ahead and answer 20, just because we've already got it on our diagram. What must be true? J is at Ransboro. Yes, 20 is A and we're done. Now, I know I've also talked about this on the other in and out game video. The kind of deduction we do want to look for on in and out games are what we call placeholder deductions. These are deductions that generally speaking, begin one way and end another. In this game, that means it's gonna begin at one clinic and end at the other. In general, it begins positively, ends negatively, or the other way around, begins negatively, ends positively. For example, if we know that when J is in, K is out, and when K is in, J is out, that means there's no way both J and K can go together on the inside, in this case, on the S side of our diagram. So instead, at least one of them must go on the outside of the diagram. And so we're gonna represent that with a placeholder. This placeholder does not mean that only one of J or K goes on the outside, it means for sure, at least one of J or K goes on the outside. This is particularly important for minimum number or maximum number style questions, which are quite common on in and out games. And you can see here is one of our general questions, number 21. The placeholders begin to tell us about the minimum or maximum number of elements that can go on either side of the diagram. Again, I can do this for any clue that begins one way and ends another, which in this particular game is almost all the clues. So I'm gonna check these off as we go to make sure I don't miss any. We already did the JK placeholder. We need to do the J-O placeholder now. Now as a little shortcut, the placeholder always goes where the conditional statements end. In this case, that's the inside or the S side of our diagram. And so that second clue means for sure one of O or J has to be on the inside. This clue does not begin positively and negatively, so we can ignore that one for the placeholder purposes. But then we need a placeholder for this L to N clue. For sure, one of N or L is gonna go on the outside. So here's how this works with the max or minimum number questions. You can tell in this case, the two placeholders I have on the outside have no elements in common. 
So that must represent two distinct places, meaning just with respect to those two placeholders, for sure the minimum that would be on that R side of the diagram is gonna be two, and right now anyway, without having looked at anything else, the maximum that's gonna go on the inside would be four. If we have placeholders that do have elements overlapping though, for example, this next one, the LP clue, which again is gonna have a placeholder on the outside, well, this does not represent necessarily three distinct spaces anymore. Because of course, if L ends up on the outside, it's actually taking care of both of those placeholders at once. So I wanna be careful with these placeholders in two ways. They represent, in some sense, at least one of those two elements must be on that side of the diagram. And then also I wanna remember, they don't always represent distinct spaces. Anywhere where the elements are totally different from each other, yes, they're distinct spaces, but anywhere I have overlap in the elements, I can't necessarily think of those as two distinct spaces. So right now, a minimum of two elements on the outside is still in play because L could be one of those two elements and take care of both of those placeholders at once. Finishing up, we've got the final two placeholders dealing with that last clue, the P clue. Again, the placeholder always goes where the clue ends. So in this case, that's positive, the inside of the diagram. I definitely need either K or P for one placeholder on the inside, either O or P for another. But again, this doesn't necessarily represent three distinct places, because for sure I can see some common elements here. P could take care of both of those placeholders. O could take care of both the first and the last placeholders we came up with. So those three placeholders don't necessarily represent three elements that for sure have to go on the inside. Just some distinctions to be careful about. We do have a pick a clue style question here, number 19, so let's go ahead and jump into that one. Which of one of the five Following could be a complete and accurate list of the doctors that are at S. In other words, for us, that are on the inside of the diagram. Because we spent time coming up with placeholders here, I don't always do this on the pick a clue style questions, but I think I wanna quickly check the placeholders and make sure to at least eliminate a few answer choices that violate the placeholders. Again, for sure we need to see the elements O or J, K or P, O or P represented on the inside of the diagram. So taking just that first placeholder, either O or J need to be in. As I look at the answer choices for 19, do I see any answer choice that doesn't have at least one of O or J? Yes. Answer choice E, right? So I can cross off answer choice E. Now here's where I do want to be careful with my placeholders. I might think, ooh, answer choice A has to be bad because it has both O and J. But this placeholder does not represent one of O or J. It represents at least one of O or J. Remember, the clue that it came from said if J is out, O is in, and if O is out, J is in, but that doesn't mean either of O or J have to be out. They could both end up on the inside and that would not violate that clue. Let's see, do we have any other placeholders that let us eliminate an answer choice? We need at least one of K or P. Uh, answer choice D is no good, right? It does not have at least one of K or P. We also need at least one of O or P. I can see O, O, and O in the remaining three choices. So I'm down to three. I've used all my placeholders. What else do I know? Well, for example, all right, answer choice A is a problem. The very first clue said when J is in, K is out, but answer choice A has both J and K on the inside. So that's no good. I can cross off answer choice A. And the other thing I want to do sometimes with one of these pick a clue style questions on an in and out game, particularly if I'm at the stage I'm at now where I only have a few answer choices left, is make sure that I remember they actually have only listed one side of my diagram. When they say J, N, O, and P are all possible elements that could be at S at the same time, that must mean the other two elements they didn't mention K and L would be on the outside at the same time. For answer choice C, if K, L, and O are on the inside, then J, N, and P must be on the outside at the same time. You'll notice this actually does still obey both the placeholders we have. K and L could account for all three of those placeholders, and for sure, J, N, and P could account for all three of those placeholders. Since we're honoring all the placeholders, probably the only thing that's going on here was that one clue that was not a placeholder. If N is out, O is supposed supposed to be out, and of course if O is in, N is supposed to be in, so I can tell that's a problem with answer choice C. O is on the inside, but N is on the outside. That's no good, and so 19 is B. All right, we already answered number 20, that first specific question, but let's go ahead and do 22. If N and O are at different clinics, which one of the following must be true? Well, telling us they're at different clinics, of course, doesn't tell us which clinic they're at. So I'm gonna suggest, let's try both possibilities. Let's say N is on the inside, O is on the outside, or O is on the inside, N is on the outside. But actually, of course, we just did that pick a clue question that depended on saying, oh, when N was on the outside, O also had 
had to be on the outside at the same time. So I can actually tell, no, never mind, this second scenario doesn't work at all. To say that N and O are at different clinics actually has to mean N is on the inside, O is on the outside. From here, we just start to get other clues that are going to apply. When O is on the outside, P is on the inside, so P has to be in. And now we start following that train, right? When P is on the inside, L is on the outside, so L has to be out. This other clue tells us when O is out, J is supposed to be in, so J is gonna go on the inside. And of course, if J is on the inside, K is on the outside. So actually, just like our other specific question, we can figure out this scenario precisely. They are once again asking a must be true question. J is on the inside, yep. Now, I'll admit, I start to get a little nervous here. I don't want to check B, C, D, and E. I don't think I should have to. A should be the right answer, but that's two specific questions in a row where the very first answer was the must be true. Really tempting at this point to check the other answer choices. If you must, you must. But again, try to break the habit because it costs time. I'm gonna trust myself. I'm gonna go ahead and move on. We do have one more specific question, number 24. If K is in, which of the following must be true? So let's go ahead and set that up. K is on the inside. Well, of course, if K is in, J is out. Look into that very first clue. And if J is out, O is in. If O is in, N is in. If N is in, L is out. Is this gonna be another scenario where we know all six? Do we know anything that happens with L being out? I'm not seeing it. We have clues that involve L being out, but that's the result of something else. It's not the cause of something else. The only element we haven't placed is P. And again, there aren't a lot of clues that result in something happening to P. In fact, I think the only one are the contrapositives to that last clue. Well, also this one up here, but none of these end up applying. If L is in, L isn't in, so that doesn't apply. If K is out, if O is out, O and K are both in, so that doesn't apply. So I think right now P can end up in either the inside or the outside of this diagram. It's another must be true, so I'm presuming the answer choice is not gonna be about P. J is on the inside? Nope, that's not true. N is on the inside? Yes, and so 24 is going to be B. Just two more questions here, and number 21, I mentioned earlier, very common question on an in and out game, min or max number question. What is the minimum number of doctors that could be on the inside? Well, for sure so far, we've seen three doctors on the inside each time with a possibility of a fourth on number 24. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can eliminate things smaller than three. Well, but I guess for sure it does mean we can eliminate anything larger than three. There's no way four can be the minimum because we've already seen a minimum of three doctors on the inside. Because of our placeholders, we couldn't possibly select zero. So I can cross off answer choice A. And again, if I think through how the elements in the placeholders overlap, there's enough variation here that those three placeholders definitely represent a minimum of two doctors on the inside. You could imagine a scenario like O and P, or for that matter, J and P, or instead you could do something like O, taking care of the first and last placeholder, and then either K or P, it wouldn't matter, taking care of that middle placeholder. So for sure we can't get one doctor in. But now the question is, is it two? Is it possible to do two? Or do we have to do three? And so what I would do at this point is just go ahead and try it out and see what happens. So we talked about a couple different arrangements arrangements where we could honor the placeholders. Something like O, K would work. Well, right away, if O is in, we know that N is in. So that's going to be three doctors. We're trying to make sure there are just two doctors. So actually, I'm gonna try and do it without O, and I can make that happen with J and P, right? If J is in, K is out. If P is in, L is out. And the only two elements I have right now left over are O and N which can go together on the outside of my diagram. And when they do, it doesn't cause anything weird to happen in this case. If O is out, P is in, for example, but we've already got P on the inside. So I think that is a possible scenario, and that tells me, yeah, we can have a minimum of two doctors on the inside of our diagram, which again for us means at S. One last question, number 23, which one of the following cannot be a pair of the doctors at Ransboro? That is, on the outside. Well, can we eliminate some answer choices here? Who has already been together on the outside? J and K, did we ever see those together? No. J and P, yeah, on the very first one we did, number 20, we saw J and P together on the outside. So get rid of B. K and O, we saw them together on 22. N and O, have we ever seen them together on the outside? Yeah, actually, on that scenario we just tried out for 21, they were together on the outside. So we can cross off D. N and P, all right, we've never seen N and P. And even here where we, oh, wait, oh, never mind. 
I was gonna say, even here where we had P as kind of a question mark, N is not on the outside, I thought maybe the other one was like J and N or something, but that's not what it said. So we're down to just two answer choices. At this point, try one of them. It doesn't matter which one. If we try answer choice A and it's a possibility, it's clearly not the answer to 23, which is looking for what cannot work. If we try A on the other hand and something causes it not to work though, then A is gonna be the best answer. Like I said, it doesn't really matter which, I'll just go ahead and try A. Can we put, oh wait, which side do I want? No, the outside. Can I put J and K together on the outside of this diagram? Well, if K is out, that means that P has to be in. If P is in, L has to be out. And the only two elements left are O and N, which definitely can go together on the inside, right? And you know, if N is in, L is out, but we're already good there. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with this scenario. I think they're hoping that we get messed up with the JK clue. But again, this clue doesn't say that they can't both be out. They could both be at Ransboro. The clue says that if one of them is at Souderton, the other one's not. And so in fact, as we try it out, we can see that it works and therefore it must be that E is the cannot be true. All right, moment of truth. Let's see how we did. Prep test 34, 19 through 24, B, A, C, A, E, B, B, A, C, A, E, B. We did it, we got them all right. Always nice, always affirming. All right, I'm sure this video is on the longer side. Thank you for sticking through it if you watched the whole thing. Thank you even if you only watched part of it, I guess. As always, I'm trying to work through all 400-ish of the official LSAC games releases. If you have a game you'd like to see me do, throw it in the comments down below, and otherwise I will see y'all next time.